Does the media we consume reflect who we are or determine who we become? Should you grow weary of the show you're watching, you can move on to countless others. Unpopular works quickly fall into obscurity, while cult classics are recycled for decades. In this world, animator Masaki Yuasa has earned accolades for his distinct style and works like Devilman Crybaby, Keep Your Hands Off Azelkin, and Lou Over the Wall. Yet his perhaps most distinct and personal work is still largely unrecognized. Part 1. Initialize Me On April 10th, 2008, Tokyo's Wow Wow Network aired the first episode of Kaiba, an anime series directed by Masaki Yuasa. Animated by Studio Madhouse, Kaiba was advertised as a science fiction love story and immediately stood out from its contemporaries with its surreal art style and complex story. Kaiba deals with interweaving themes of love, tragedy, classism, technology, and identity. With visuals that evoke a dizzying blend of Dr. Seuss's Oh, The Places You'll Go and Hideaki Anno's End of Evangelion, the series was critically acclaimed, receiving an excellence prize for animation at the 2008 Japan Media Arts Festival. Despite this, the series remains largely unknown outside of Japan. Kaiba is set in a space-age world where memory is treated like data. It can be duplicated, transferred, changed, and deleted. As a result, when individuals die, their minds are able to live on in another body. In this world, memories take physical form outside of our minds and float down a shimmering river in space to be sorted in memory tanks. Our protagonist, Kaiba, who is introduced without a name, wakes with no memory of who he is or what he wants, only to find himself in a collapsing society, his only possession a pendant with a blurry photo of a woman inside. Immediately, the dangers of a world where physical bodies are a commodity become apparent, as Kaiba is pursued for having a rare and valuable body. With the help of an enigmatic man named Popo, Kaiba stows away on a spaceship and travels from planet to planet, piecing together who he is and learning more about the world that the memory manipulation technology has created. Unbeknownst to Kaiba, his absence creates a power vacuum, and his homeworld becomes a battlefield for supremacy. I first encountered Kaiba in 2011 while searching for recommendations for my college anime club. As the founder, I wanted to find anime that our members hadn't seen before, and I made it my personal mission to broaden their definition of what anime was. When someone passed the name Kaiba on to me, I could only think of the Yu-Gi-Oh character. I had never heard of it before, and it was already three years old at that point. It was surprisingly hard to track down, only one fan subbing group had done it at the time, and even Raws were difficult to find. After screening the first episode for the club, I fell in love with the bleak but colorful world and its mesmerizing imagery. I went ahead and watched the entire series on my own in just a few days. I would love to recap the entire plot for you, but in Yuasa's own words, it's a difficult story to summarize, and I think doing so would be a disservice to the anime. If you've never seen or heard of the series before, I highly encourage you to check out a few episodes. The series has become much easier to find in recent years, so I'll try to include links to legal streaming sites in the description below. I've tried to make this a companion piece to the series, but I will be discussing some elements that could spoil a first viewing, so consider this your spoiler warning. The first half of the series is comprised of episodic vignettes that introduce us to the bizarre and dangerous setting of Kaiba. The focus of each episode varies greatly, while still adhering to the central theme of love. In one episode, we see a devoted daughter sell her body, literally not in the sexual way, to help the family she loves. In another, we see how an old woman's love for her husband paralyzes her. And in another still, we see how a mad scientist's love of his craft is perverted into a macabre version of his original intentions. The series explores a different form of love in each tightly bookended episode. After my initial viewing of Kaiba, my favorite character was Vanilla, the boorish sheriff who flexes authority for personal gain. Although seemingly antagonistic, Vanilla's curt exterior is chipped away to reveal he secretly works to buy a new body for his mother's memories. Over the course of the series, Vanilla abuses his power to impress his love interest, Chronico, but when his transgressions come to a head, Vanilla protects her before himself, even going as far as to lie to her to encourage her to retreat without him. As he transmits her memories to a distant body, 
Vanilla tearfully imagines that Chronico is smiling at him. Despite having no chemistry, Vanilla gives himself unconditionally to Chronico because he is infatuated with the idea of her, and his final moments reveal that he knows this. He wants desperately for his love to be reciprocated, but ultimately, when he realizes his devotion to her will yield no returns, he sacrifices himself for her anyway. He knows this wasn't love, but it's the closest thing he could come to something like it. In college, I loved this sort of thing. I was a sucker for chivalry, the idea that a man could live by a code or oath to be upstanding and cordial. There was something romantic about it to me, so I very much saw myself in Vanilla. Unexamined, that felt like a comfortable code to live by, but in retrospect, I realized that I never planned on success. I couldn't imagine myself in what I would consider to be a successful relationship with anyone. You could say that I saw myself as a chevalier with no purpose, destined to eke out a meaningful life through a tragic, likely unrequited death. Although the intention behind chivalry is noble, it infected me with toxic ideals of martyrdom that made me devalue myself. Subconsciously, I thought that I could only earn my place through sacrifice, or acting against my own interests. Vanilla's story is just one of several tragic viewpoints in Kaiba. Although the memory-saving technology could be used to solve so many issues, it's consistently misused, creating more problems than it solves. Despite the incredible potential, the ability to swap bodies and alter memories doesn't make anyone happy in more than a superficial way. Even when it does briefly improve someone's life, the technology ultimately fails. Part 2. The World No One Cares About in 2015, after starting a dream job at a fast-paced tech company, I started a Twitter account at the recommendation of some co-workers. It felt like they were introducing me to the digital world that I had always dreamed about as a kid, to have internet friends or even some fame. Series like TTA and Dot .hack enamored me to the idea of being part of a close-knit group of friends online. After some cajoling and a chat room of their fans suggesting usernames, my Twitter career began. I had made a Facebook account in high school under similar circumstances, so this didn't feel that weird to me. It started out well enough, but soon thinking of pithy observations to tweet became more of a job than a hobby. Still, I was excited to try. I wanted to fit in. Social media is a powerful tool for staying connected, but it also allows us to cultivate how people see us. Scrolling through a profile reveals the parts of an individual's personality that they choose to post. Conscientiously or not, we highlight the parts of ourselves that we want to share. As a result, Profiles aren't an accurate representation of a person, but a persona they display to the world. Some people are more mindful of that aspect of social media, but we all participate in it, myself included. I worried about how I would be perceived and meticulously panicked about every post I made. I wasn't sure how much of myself was okay to share and feared that parts of myself would be rejected. The medium also presented a challenge. While text is an effective means of communication, it does depend on some interpretation on the part of the reader, and nuance is usually lost. Misunderstandings happen. Feelings get hurt. Sorry, dude. Missed your texts. I assumed we'd meet at the bar. Whatever. I don't care. Sorry, dude. Missed your texts. I assumed we'd meet at the bar. Whatever. I don't care. Whatever. I don't care. In a word, it was stressful. Despite the potential it presents, not everyone embraces the memory technology. This sentiment is held most fervently by Isodan, a terrorist group united by the common goal of destroying the memory technology. Members of the group protest the technology by refusing to transfer their consciousness to another body. However, several key officers of the group hypocritically use the technology to serve their own purposes. The temptation to use the technology becomes too strong for people at an individual level, and many of Isodan's members are driven to use it. While some voluntarily use it for personal gain, others are forced to change bodies due to disease, a practice that seems entirely reasonable, but is still demonized. While most are kept loyal through the religious presentation of the group, its fluctuating hierarchy of corrupt leaders reflects the futility of resisting the memory technology. If they aren't lured by the opportunity it presents, they are driven to use it for their own survival. Resistance without some form of integration is impossible. Part of what makes Isodon's dogma so compelling is its inclusion of an archenemy, Warp, the king of memories. Although memory chips and bodies are exchanged in an ostensibly free market, the origin of this technology can be sourced to the king of this galactic society, who rules with a callous disinterest in his subjects. To them, 
Warp is the source of everything wrong with the world, and destroying him represents the lower class rising up and striking back against a malicious entity. In reality, the people's suffering is tragically incidental. Warp isn't just one person. Warp is a role performed by clones of the original King of Memories. An unknown amount of time before the beginning of Kaiba, the original Warp was born with a miraculous body, granting him two unique traits. An impervious body that couldn't be harmed from the outside, and the ability to store an infinite number of memories inside him. When the original Warp's life came to an end, his body was cloned in the hopes of passing on his incredible power. However, the traits that made Warp so special were recessive, and only one in every thousand clones inherited that power. Kaiba is the latest clone in that cycle, but if nothing changes, he won't be the last. Before his memory is erased, he knows what happens to rejected Warp clones, and what will happen to him should he outlive his usefulness. Kaiba is the most powerful person in the universe, and the most disposable. Late into the series, we see Kaiba struggling with how to carry himself as Chronico, revealing that, as long as he is in her body, Kaiba is trying to live the sort of life that Chronico would want to live. As Chronico, Kaiba acts out of character and lives inauthentically as himself, choosing to assume a persona instead. This comes naturally to Kaiba, as he has spent his entire life living as the Persona Warp, his head stuffed with lifetimes of obligation and expectation. Until he meets Nero, someone who loves him unconditionally for who he is, Kaiba never authentically lives as himself because he has always been taught to be someone else. I'm not sure when it started, but ever since I was little, I've been subconsciously motivated to do things for other people rather than for myself. I don't mean for that to sound noble. I did what I thought I was expected to do, an unspoken command reinforced by school, social life, and media. It's more evident to me now, but everything I did was entrenched in expectation. I did what I thought I was supposed to do. I followed this instinct unquestioningly. After high school, I went to college because that's what you did. After college, I got a job because that's what you did. My entire life, it seemed, was on a track. I was born into a certain expectation, and I felt like I could see the chapters of my life laid out in front of me like a to-do list. Over time, this mindset seeped into all of my decision-making. I bought games that I didn't want to play because my friends liked them. I took jobs that didn't further my personal goals because I was told to do them. I wore clothes I didn't want to wear because I saw other people wear them. With every decision, the voice of expectation rang louder and louder in my mind, drowning out the sound of my own. It didn't matter what I wanted. I had to do what I was expected to do. At some point, I stopped living for myself. That sounds kind of extreme, but it really wasn't so bad. I was content to put my one second, especially because everything was working out so well. My family was happy, I was moving up in the world, hell, I had even gotten my dream job. Under the surface, however, the expectations I was living by were causing me to question my own desires. I believed that what I wanted was impossible, so following suggestion was an easy substitute. The positive reinforcement that came from following the plan numbed my pain. Without realizing it, I slipped into a persona that I could show to the world. At work, I started taking jobs that I didn't want to do in the hopes that by taking my lumps, eventually I'd earn my place. I believed that if I did the work no one else wanted to do, I would be recognized. What's worse, whenever I found myself disappointed from a lack of recognition, I blamed myself. Much like Vanilla and Kaiba, I stopped living for myself and took on a role. I felt like an object to my peers. Part 3. Memories of Death some viewers have observed that Kaiba bears a strong visual resemblance to The Little Prince, a 1943 French novella by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Yuasa himself has acknowledged the similarity, but says it's only a coincidence. Both stories feature a boyish prince traveling to various planetoids, but they also warn of the dangers of neglect by way of the baobab tree in The Little Prince and the Kaiba plant in Kaiba. Both plants start small and manageable, but grow out of control when left unattended. In The Little Prince, the baobab tree symbolizes how depression must be dealt with early when it is small and manageable, or else it will grow like the baobab and subsume the entire planet. In Kaiba, the plant instead represents nihilism and the call of the abyss. 
The Kaiba plant's story is told through a song heard in episode 6, which describes an old and lonely tree that swallows up the memories of other creatures to fill an emptiness inside itself. The song goes on to say that after the tree has consumed everything, night and day no longer exist, and the tree stands still, alone against a backdrop of nothingness. This idea is revisited when Popo achieves his Pyrrhic victory over Warp. Though he becomes king, he loses everyone he wanted to help with that power, and quickly gives in to despair. When he sees the Kaiba plant approaching, he welcomes it, knowing that it will destroy him. The design of the plant was inspired by the dilapidated Cambodian reliefs of Ta Prom, which Yuasa found creepy and interesting. He liked the image of the trees growing out of the ruin, and used the visual of the rampantly growing plant as a symbol of destruction. The plant has a particular significance to Warp. Sometime before the series takes place, the Kaiba plant grew out of control and threatened all life in its path. Warp fought back the monstrous plant by feeding it his happy memories, reducing it back to the jaunty little sprout we see in episode 6, but losing those memories in the process. As a result, Warp loses faith in humanity. Depression can have a similar effect in my experience, causing one to fixate on the negative, even if there was good that came with it. Depression has a way of clouding one's perception and making them focus on negativity. Moreover, just like the Kaiba plant, if it's not dealt with early, depression can grow out of control. The central image of Kaiba's homeworld, with its swirling vortex at the center, evokes that feedback loop, visually representing how depression keeps us from moving forward. Over time, I think fatigue set in. Work became stressful and unfulfilling, and I felt less and less like a part of my team. My role was transitioning into more and more of the work I was doing out of obligation, and I was miserable. While some of my coworkers attempted to bolster my quickly plummeting self-esteem, their words felt unearned to me and didn't reach me. I felt like they couldn't see me. I became irritable and cynical, treated kindness like pity. When someone from another department pulled me aside to express concern that I looked thinner, I told her that nothing was wrong. In truth, I had lost 20 pounds in two weeks because I had stopped eating. My life started to fall into a rhythm, resting for daily work, working for daily rest. As time went on, my interest continued to wane. I stopped watching anime, I stopped playing games, I stopped meeting with people for lunch. When my therapist observed that I was exhibiting signs of anhedonia, the inability to feel joy, my only response was that I was at my dream job. By 2018, I had fallen into a deep depression. I made it a little over a year in my new role before burning out and quitting my job. It was poor timing, and the ensuing loss of identity left me hollow. I lost touch with my former co-workers as I struggled to maintain relevance in their world. And because I had worked in an industry I was passionate about, the hobbies I used to enjoy became cruel reminders of my failure. After getting into an argument online with a friend, I started questioning all of my relationships. I poured over chat logs and tweets from years past, grasping at any form of security I could find that proved my friendships valid. Of course, I was never going to find the evidence I frantically sought. Even if it was there, my negative bias wouldn't allow me to see it. Instead, I saw that my friends were doing well. Some were thriving, while others who were in pain hadn't reached out to me for help. I couldn't contain my emotions. I felt like I had missed out on so much. I felt discarded and alone. I wanted to avoid being rejected myself, so I took action. I unfriended them before they could unfriend me. In searching for agency, I fell into a pitfall. I probably would have been better off if I hadn't done anything, but in looking for action, I isolated myself. In the months following my exit from the company, my world became starkly small. Suddenly, I wasn't surrounded by peers who I would see every day through work. I stopped going outside and taking care of my appearance. I would sleep all day, and when I woke, I tried to fall back asleep because being awake was too painful. My room felt like it belonged to someone else, a reflection of all the different people I had tried to please, but hardly anything that could be recognized as me. I was alone. Surrounded by toys I never wanted, games I would never play, movies I didn't want to watch, all still in the box. Months started to blur together. I'll be honest, I don't remember most of the past year. It's just kind of a haze. 
In the darkness of my foreign room, I started to give away my belongings. They didn't make me happy, so they weren't worth keeping. As I sifted through piles of physical media, I found my copy of Kaiba. It was kind of amazing to me that the series had been licensed and distributed at all. It was finally published in the United States in 2018, ten years after the series had aired. Maybe it was because the art style was so drastically different, but looking at the box, I wasn't reminded of my previous job. I was instead taken back to college, back to when I loved anime. I thought that maybe by going back, revisiting what I loved, I could rekindle the interest I had lost. As the title theme began, I felt a wave of familiarity wash over me, like being swaddled in a warm blanket. Watching the series with fresh eyes, I noticed the themes of gender ambiguity. I wondered, in a world where people can swap bodies, do individuals even have an assigned gender? In episode 6, The Muscled Woman, Kaiba meets Nero in a man's body while he is in Chronicos. Although they don't recognize each other, the two connect over their shared dysphoria, with Kaiba not understanding the complexities of his feminine body, and Nero lamenting that she is uncomfortable going to the bathroom. She expresses to him that people should be in bodies appropriate for their gender. He remarks that when he first woke with no memory, he wasn't sure which gender he was. Something about that sentiment was really relatable to me. Kaiba isn't certain of his gender until he lives as himself, at which point it's finally evident to him that he's male. The show certainly plays with gender ambiguity in many of the character designs, but was I reading too much into it? Still, the thought stayed with me. One day, as I was walking by Akino Kunia, I noticed a familiar character on the cover of an art book that was on display. The outfit was different, and the lines were rough, but there was no doubt in my mind that Kaiba was on the cover of this book. At first I was confused. I knew Kaiba was a commercial failure. The only merchandise that exists, to my knowledge, are three plastic figures that were sold at one fest for two days only. So why was it featured so prominently on the cover of a book? In the US, no less. The book, I soon discovered, was Masaki Iwasa's sketchbook for animation projects, and it was filled with his notes. I was curious, so I bought it. I wanted to know what the series creator thought of his own work. Much to my surprise, while I was reading it, a second book was published that also featured Kaiba prominently on the cover. Now I knew it wasn't a coincidence. Out of the many anime he had worked on, Yuasa chose to feature Kaiba prominently on the cover of two of his art books. I had to know why. So I spent eight months translating the book by hand. I wasn't confident in all of my translation work, but if it was going to be wrong, I wanted it to be my mistake. I needed to know if what I had seen in the show was intentional or not. This is what I learned. Part 4. The World He Made on a Desk In 2006, animator Masaki Yuasa was hard at work directing his first anime series, Kemonozume, the tragic love story of Yuka, a woman cursed to hunger for human flesh, and Toshihiko, a swordsman who was duty-bound to slay her. Unlike previous works, Yuasa's fingerprints were all over Kimonozume. From the script to the storyboards, he worked closely with almost every aspect of production. Reception for the series was lackluster. A commercial flop, audiences noted the animation looked dirty and out of place on the backgrounds, which were often collages of stylized photographs in real-world locations. However, in the final weeks of production, while animating a particular scene, Yuasa was struck with inspiration. Yuasa found himself designing a scene where one character stepped into the dream of another and entered a psychedelic and illusory world. This idea stayed with Yuasa long after production ended. He continued turning the idea over in his head. How would it look to enter someone's mind? Are memories stored like books or like records? And what does a memory look like when it's outside of someone's head? Two years later, these ideas found their way into his next work, Kaiba. Kaiba was influenced by the anxiety Yuasa felt in his late 20s. Having recently moved to Tokyo, he found himself feeling lonely and out of place. During this time, he would frequently go to the library alone because he didn't have a mentor. He wondered, what did the people who came before me live for, and how does one accept the inevitability of death? He also recounts an argument he had with one of his friends at the time, and having a desire to express the idea that we all experience life from one perspective. 
and that from another perspective, things can be seen very differently, both figuratively and literally. From the outset, Yuasa intended to make a series that was more appealing than Kimonozume, taking inspiration from manga artists Shigeru Sugiyuda and Osamu Tezuka, as well as early Disney animation. Working closely with character designer Nobutaki Ito, Yuasa focused on character designs with short legs and long bodies, a departure from his more realistic figures, to create a style that he thought would be more approachable to younger audiences. Yuasa admits that in hindsight, the character designs proved to have the opposite effect, remarking that the style was nostalgic for his generation, but maybe scared most younger audiences off. In creating the cosmic setting for the show, Yuasa decided he wanted to make a truly alien world that barely resembled our own. What few references he did use were heavily transformed beyond recognition, such as architecture reminiscent of upside-down European cathedrals and spaceship designs inspired by ancient Chinese pottery. Yuasa notes that because Kaiba had much fewer creative restrictions, it was a much more enjoyable experience than working on Kimonozume. The bookended vignettes were particularly fun for him to write, and he thinks he could have written 50 episodes just like them, naming Galaxy Express 3-9 as an inspiration. He also mentions Shakespearean tragedies as a model for his story, although he ironically states that the love story element was really secondary for him. Yuasa paid particular attention to the way characters move, as their habits are inherited when they jump from body to body. Even with their memories gone, characters still maintain a consistent body language, suggesting that they can't help but be themselves, even without knowing who they are. Ultimately, Yuasa wanted to create something that was difficult to watch, but left the viewer feeling hopeful. At first, I was troubled to see that after weeks of translation, gender wasn't a central point for Yuasa. Instead, he discusses the reception to telling his staff that he wanted a protagonist that changes shape, one that specifically changes their appearance a second time to further abstract them from the audience, and how most people reacted with surprise and concern, mostly over who would voice such a character. Not all of Yuasa's plans made it into the final product, but as I read more of his notes, I began to get the impression that Kaiba was more than a standard anime project for him. In the back of his second art book, Yuasa includes a sketch for an original character concept, Franken and Toto, a cat-like mad scientist who is followed around by a patchwork dog. Yuasa writes that he wanted to write a story about a mad scientist whose schemes accidentally make the world a better place for a very long time, but wasn't able to use the idea. Luckily, Franken and Toto fit perfectly into the world of Kaiba, and were finally animated in episode 5 of the series as Patch and Quilt. It really seemed like he put a lot of himself in the series, more so than any of his other projects. It was clear to me that Yuasa intended to infuse Kaiba with themes of despair and hope, but I didn't fully realize it until I had read his thoughts on episode 10 of the series. Episode 10 of Kaiba opens with a flashback to Kaiba and Nero's first meeting. It's one of the few moments in the series that we see Kaiba with his memories of being warp intact, and we see him falling, passing through the memory-erasing clouds and into the abyss below. As warp, Kaiba experiences a life of obligation and duty, surrounded by people he isn't sure whether he can trust. With so many siblings plotting regicide, Kaiba can't let his guard down around anyone. When his mother poisons him to spare him from the conflict, Kaiba misinterprets this as the final knife in the back. There's no one he can trust living only out of obligation for others. We never see the moments before this scene, but the implication wasn't lost on me. Kaiba doesn't fall to his supposed death. He jumps. Yuasa explicitly describes this scene as Kaiba's attempted suicide. What's so interesting to me is that if the audience didn't know what this was, I'm not sure they would reach the conclusion that Kaiba was attempting to take his own life. Just like in real life, Kaiba's suicide attempt isn't super obvious. What's more, we aren't shown the moment before when Kaiba decides to end his own life. No one sees him until Nero first notices him falling from the sky. The scene isn't animated because there is no audience for Kaiba's suicide. It happens when he is alone and no one is around to see. Part 5. Beyond Theory Seeing the emphasis Yuasa put on this scene made me see the series in a different light. Kaiba's core conflict is internal. Although external forces pursue Kaiba, by the series' climax, the antagonist plotlines have all been resolved without his involvement. The ultimate conflict is between Kaiba, the clone who falls in love with Nero, and Warp, the king who has lost faith in the goodness of people. 
Kaiba realizes over the course of his one adventure what Warp has forgotten over ages of collecting memories, that love is worth living for, and that there is goodness in people worth saving. For Yuasa, Kaiba was intended to be an exploration in what he calls beyond theory. He wanted to express the idea that even though something might not make sense theoretically, it could still be emotionally true. For Kaiba and Nero, although their memories have been altered to make them believe they were enemies, their feelings pierce through the manipulation because their love is emotionally true. Something about that idea really spoke to me, and I started to think about my own life. There were things that I wanted that I felt were impossible, but maybe I'd just fooled myself into thinking that way. I felt like a frog that had just realized it'd been living in water its entire life. Yuasa grew out of the negative experiences he had working on Kemonozume to create something new and personal. And although Kaiba was a commercial failure, it still had a lot of value. Commercial anime and social media have that in common. Popularity is the metric for success, not depth. So complicated stories, although important, are lost in the media saturation. This isn't to say that something being popular is bad, but nuanced stories that require time to unpack don't succeed in an environment where instant gratification and ease of access is the dominant factor for success. Kaiba is a difficult show to watch. It doesn't hold the audience's hand in telling its story, and as a result, wasn't appealing to many people. That, however, doesn't seem to have stopped Yuasa from celebrating Kaiba, despite its niche appeal. In 2018, 10 years after the release, he publicly screened the series in a marathon at the Ikebukuro New Literature Center. When Nero helps Kaiba break free of his misanthropy, he recognizes that the memory technology does more harm than good. It allows him to hold on to grief and allows people to hurt each other, but it doesn't improve the quality of anyone's life. With a gigantic memory-devouring plant looming overhead, Kaiba makes the world-shaking decision to destroy the memory tanks and the countless memories kept therein. When the monstrous plant eagerly devours the memories, it bursts, ensuring that it will never threaten humanity again. In the final scene, Nero searches for Kaiba as Popo and the other surviving of Isodon wake with no memories. If there is any benefit to the memory technology, it's that it allows all the characters, good and bad, to start fresh. It's left to the audience to decide whether Kaiba's memories are intact when he looks up at Nero, but whether you believe they are or not, there's hope that the two will create new ones together. To Yuasa, this scene was meant to express the idea that even without their memories, Kaiba and Nero are drawn to each other. This final message is contradictory to what a lot of Western media tells us. Where many stories reinforce the idea of preserving history, Kaiba says that, on an individual level, we don't need it. Reflecting on the past doesn't offer clarity because so much can be twisted and read into it. In the first episode, as Popo bids Kaiba farewell, he closes by saying to him, your name is Warp. To Kaiba and the audience, this information is superficial. It's a name with as much significance as any other. To Popo, however, this is an act of condemnation, a reinforcement that, despite how friendly he seems, these two are mortal enemies. Popo, informed by his past, assigns Kaiba an identity, but although the history and evidence seem to support him, Popo is factually wrong here. Kaiba isn't Warp. In the face of overwhelming evidence, even his own memory, Kaiba determines his identity for himself. It's beyond the evidence beyond anything anyone could have told him, but he finds it. If translating Yuasa's story taught me anything, it's that he was most happy when he was doing what he wanted for himself. Even though Kaiba wasn't commercially successful, creating the story still brought him a lot of joy. No one can give you that sort of authenticity. You have to find it for yourself. Looking over my Twitter profile again, it's easy for me to get swept up in sad memories. Social media reinforces the persona the least deep part of the self. It's not an accurate reflection of who I am or the relationships I've had. It hasn't helped me stay connected to the people I love. It's only paralyzed me in an endless cycle of anxiety, jealousy, and depression. Like the memory technology, social media hasn't made me happy. It's only caused me grief. I want to move forward as myself. So what was I trying to say with all of this? 
Um, it definitely started as an attempt to get more people to see Kaiba, but I think it really grew from there. Um, like I said, partially it was me trying to take my hobby back, but I think partially it was also me trying to tell my story. Um, I tried to keep it relatable, so I hope that it translated, but I think... I don't think I'm alone, um, I guess, in, in experiencing FOMO or this social media anxiety. So I guess this proves I was right all along. Social media, it's a fool's game and only a fool would play. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And why is Cheddar wearing a beret? Uh... That said, it feels kind of bad to be saying social media is bad right now when in the wake of the coronavirus, it's really been an essential platform for keeping people together. I think the big difference is I'm using social media differently now. Um, I feel like a big component to my negativity was how I interacted with social media. But at the same time, I also think people are, are just more genuinely and authentically reaching out to each other. Um, but that's just my experience. This project really helped me get back to myself and, and come back into the world. That feeling of, of apathy, just not wanting to do anything, um, that's the worst feeling there is. Um, I'm a little sad because I didn't get to include all the, a, a couple fun facts, um, and, and now that I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Yuasa retired about uh, a month ago uh, since I recorded and uh, recording this. So um, it, it feels like a very strange time to be putting this video out. Um, he recently put out a, a tweet with um, his recommendations for what you should watch of his catalog, and Kaiba's still on there, as well as Kimono Zume. So uh, one, one thing I wish I could have included in this was. Uh, the the old couple is actually a trope that he uses in both anime so so look out for that i guess if you end up watching both and for anyone who's interested in in the books that i used uh, i'll try to include links but i i definitely recommend the first book is fantastic it's full of illustrations a great coffee table book and his second book uh the world no one cares about i, I forgot how to say it in japanese uh, that one is, is full of, of many more anecdotes, stories about production, and, and it's much more text. So uh, I, I very much encourage anybody who's interested in checking those out to pick them up. Um, and thank you for, for watching this. It's unreal to me that it's finished, but... <laughs>